see you. Oh man, hey, we're in the middle of July. Just thinking about that yesterday already. Already. But time may change, but God never does. So let's just start with uh, just our opening prayer of, of the promises of who He is and what He is. Let's pray. Oh, glory to God, glory to God on high. You're our King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who ever believes Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're our good God Almighty. You're our awesome God. Again, you're our rock, our sword, our shield. There's nothing greater than you. There's no rock stronger, no mountain higher, no ocean deeper. Because you created everything and you created us to worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, we need you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our memory verse today is from the book of 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He has not given us. Fear has nothing to do with God. It was power, love, and self-control. See if you can see which words, word specifically, that we are singing in all four songs that go with this memory verse. That's worship. Second Timothy 1, 7. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Second Timothy 1, 7. Whoa, whoa. A spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. Second Timothy 1 7. Whoa, whoa. Second Timothy 1 7. Oh, 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 oh. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self control. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self control. Second Timothy one seven. Whoa, whoa. Second Timothy one seven. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. All right, friends. This is a new VBS song, and what we love about it is I know the reason why my feet can't stop, my heart can't help but sing. What's the reason? It's because the your love is the answer. The reason is Jesus, and so it just overflows. His love for us just overflows and should do it in everything we do. Just, should, just pure joy. What do you think of that? Yeah, nice. Do you okay. want me to stop? No, we're fine. Okay, and I had the wrong slide up. Still, it's the same. It was still. Yeah. I know the reason why my feet can't stop, my heart can't help but sing. It's a wonderful feeling to feel your love for me, to feel the joy you bring. Your love. Reason is you, Jesus. You're why I'm singing out. The reason is you, Jesus. You're what it's all about. At the cross, you set me free, and I'm thankful that you love me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thankful that you love me. Whoa, Are up, my feet and stamp below. It's a 
morning comes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noon time, Jesus when the sun comes down. Father, you are our good God Almighty. And just we thank you and we need the Holy Spirit just to offer to you the love that you've shown us. We need your love. We need your to give. We need our, your patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control praise, our prayers, and our forgiveness. We give all that to you, Father. Oh, we love you and praise you. May the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart, be accepted of you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, friends, it was so great worshiping with you. Wishing you a great class, a great day, and a great week. Until we see you again, God bless. Well, hello, boys and girls. I'm Teacher Rick, and I want to welcome you to another 
wonderful adventure in Sunday school land. We've been going through the Bible, learning about King David, learning how David was a man after God's heart. And now God took a shepherd boy who was just a little runt to the family and made him king of the nation of Israel. So, I'd like to welcome you to the class and thanks for coming. So kids, have you ever been afraid? What makes you afraid? What do you do when you're afraid? Sometimes fear can cause us to do dangerous things and strange things and things we, we would never think about doing, but because we're afraid, we do them. All right, grown-ups can become afraid too, even kings and, and soldiers. So let's find out what happened to a king and to a soldier who each became afraid, all right? And they let fear take control of their actions. One did the right thing, one did not do the right thing. So let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are our rock, our hiding place, our strong fortress. You are the one that we come to when we're afraid, Lord. You are the one that we go to when we have problems. You're the one that can fix things for us. You're the ones that back us up. You're the one that, that just uh, that loves us without end. Lord, you're the one that died for us. And you're the one that saved us from our sins. Lord, be our rock, be our fortress, be our stronghold, Lord. Help us in times of need. When we're afraid, Lord, give us the strength to resist the fear. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. So, memory verse, kiddos. This one is from 2 Timothy 1.7. And it says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 2.7. All right, so what has God given us? He's given us his spirit. Okay, not just some something he grabbed off the street and says, here, go, go help this guy out. He's given us the Holy Spirit, the same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that allowed the apostles to share the gospel with the entire known world. Okay? God has given us his spirit, and he's given us his spirit to help us to make better decisions, to make right decisions. Doesn't mean we're not going to still make dumb decisions, but it just means that he gives us the opportunity to make more and better decisions. Okay, he lives in us, helping us to live right, helping us to pray to God for the things we need and the people we need to pray for. Okay, so what spirit has he given us? Okay, one that tells us not to be afraid. God's in control. Remember that saying, if God is for us, who can be against us? If you believe God is who he says he is, and he says he's for you, then why are you worried about somebody, some little something else that, that can only annoy you? God can take care of it, all right? The Holy Spirit allows us to have this faith, okay, if we allow him. He needs to be able to work in us, and we can resist him, and we can tell him no, and he's not going to make us do anything, so he just lets us do what we want to do. And unfortunately, the results are usually not all that great. So what do you think, kids? You want the spirit that he offers us, the Holy Spirit, or do you want the spirit of fear? So if we're afraid, what spirit do we have? If we're bold and trusting, what spirit do we have? What spirit do you want to have? So today's lesson comes from God's Word, the Bible. It's always God's Word. It comes from the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 28, 1 through 19, 29, verse 1 through chapter 30, verse 19. Lots of verses. We won't read them all, but we'll talk about them. Okay, but the most important thing to remember is our memory verse, 2 Timothy 2.7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 2.7 
So instead of being afraid, we have a, a spirit of power. We have a spirit of love that helps us love God. And then it helps us love his creation, people. Okay, if we, if we love God, we have to love who he created. All right, if we don't love God, then it's easy to not love who he created. Okay, self-control. Kiddos, trust me, we all lack self-control, all right? Self-control is being able to control your emotions, being able to say no when you want something and you can't have it, being able to say, I'm sorry when you do something wrong. That's self-control. We don't have a lot of that, kids, and you're not alone. I'm just as bad as you are. So let's get started in our lesson, okay? We got the first poster. There's David, and there's King Aixius, who is a Philistine king, okay? So you remember last week we were talking about how, you know, the David in the strongholds and how David cut off a chunk of Saul's robe and Saul promised not to chase him for a little bit and then start chasing him again. And then David took his spear and his water jug and Saul promised not to chase him. But, you know, we know Saul wasn't really a truthful person. So David probably thought that one day Saul would catch him and kill him. And he was afraid, okay? He didn't trust God. He trusted in himself. He was afraid that Saul would kill him. The problem is David didn't remember what God's promise was to him. God promised him that he would be king one day. How are you going to be king if you're dead? Okay, so David's fear of Saul took away his hope. Okay, so did David ask God what to do? No. No, David did what he thought was the right thing to do. David decided to follow his own plan. So kids, how do things work out when you follow your own plan? I know for me, they do, it usually has not a good result when, when I follow my own plan. All right, and then I wish I'd followed God's plan. But it's too late because now I have to live with the consequence of my own plan. Okay, so David and his men ran from Saul. Okay, didn't trust God. And he went to the land of the Philistines, which is the enemy of Israel. David and his men were Israelites. And they, so the Philistines should have been their, their enemies, okay? But they figured that Saul wouldn't pursue him in the land of the Philistines. David probably thought he was safe now. And we read in 1 Samuel 27, verse 1 through 3, the Bible tells us, So David arose and went over, he and his 600 men, who were with him, to Achish, the son of Mauk, Mauk, king of Gath. That's a heck of a word. David lived with Achish and Gath, and he and his men, every man with his household. And David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezre of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. All right. So after a time, David living in the city of Gath, David asked Achish for a place to of their own for him and his 600 men and their families. And Achish gave him the city of Ziklag. Okay. And so we read in Samuel, 1 Samuel 27, 5 through 7. Then David said to Achish, if I've found favor in your eyes, in other words, if I've done good and you like me, let a place be given to me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there as I can live there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And a number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. So, 16 months, David didn't trust the Lord. In 16 months, David lived with the arch enemy of the Jews, the Philistines. Okay? But now David and his men had a place to call home, the city of Ziklag. So, in order to make Achish think that David was loyal to him, David had to pretend that he was fighting the Jews, okay? So David and his men would go out and they'd raid other, other tribes, usually all the enemies of, of Israel, and defeat them and wipe them out so they couldn't tell. And they'd come back with all the spoil and say, look what we got. And Achish thought, oh my goodness, they're doing so great. They're attacking their own people. This is so wonderful, okay? So... Life went on, and one day Achish tells David that he wants David and his men to march with them because they're going to war with the Jews, with Israel, okay? And they're going to march 
and, and fight the Israeli army. Okay? What's David going to do? He don't want to fight his own people. He was just trying to stay hidden so Saul would leave him alone. Okay? David had allowed his fear to put him in a position that he had seemed to appear to have no way out. Okay? David's decision to join the Philistines was completely controlled by fear. But now he was more afraid than ever because now he's going, what am I going to do? I can't attack my own people. He, what? What am I going to do? Okay, so needless to say, the consequences aren't so great for David making his own choice, is it? All right. Who's that? That's King Saul. Remember King Saul? King Saul was the guy that didn't listen to God, and God told him, you're not going to be king anymore because you're, you're just not cutting it, and we're going to make David king. And you remember how Saul was so jealous of David, he kept trying to kill him, which was why J David was with the Philistines right now. So Saul's scared to death now. We read in 1 Samuel 28, 3 through 6, and we'll get to that. So Saul looks out, and he sees this huge Philistine army coming, all right? And Saul is scared, okay? Why do you think he was afraid? Because Saul didn't trust God, didn't even consult God. <clears throat> and he was looking at the number of troops, thinking that he didn't have enough of his own and he was going to be in, in serious trouble, okay? He had been disobeying God for so long he didn't know, he didn't care, and he didn't even follow what God had to say to him, what God's will was for him. Now, Saul had to know what God's will was for him. But one day, Saul finally realized that he needed God's help, and he called out to God. He asked the Lord, what should he do? But God no longer answered him, because God had rejected him, and he had rejected God. And so God didn't answer him. So Saul's calling out to God, and he's not getting an answer. And Saul's getting more scared by the minute. So, kids, did you know that sin stands between you and God? Sin is anything you think, say, or do that breaks God's law, causes him to be sad. You and I are born wanting to do the wrong things. <clears throat> it's not something we're, we learn to do. It's our nature. Mom and dad never teach us to lie or to steal or to be angry or throw hissy fits. It's, it's, it's who we are. It's what we do. Okay, Romans 3.23 tells us that all, what does all mean? All in the Greek means everybody. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't say everybody except. It says all, everybody. Okay, so what do we do about it? Well, the good thing is God's so awesome John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus told his followers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we can access God through Jesus Christ. Okay, and Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. Remember, there were no Christians when Jesus went to the cross. Not yet. Okay, but he went to the cross willingly, knowing that uh, most of them were going to reject him, but some were not going to. So Jesus paid the price for our sins. And if we believe him, if we believe on what he did, and we ask him to be our Lord and Savior, we can also have that wall of sin taken down between God and us. And we now have access to God with our prayers and with our supplications and with our requests, okay? We can be adopted into the family of God, have eternal life with him in heaven. Something you want, kids? All you got to do is tell Jesus, come into my life, okay? So, Saul doesn't hear from God, and Saul's getting worked up. What does he do? Because he's desperate, all right? He knows that Samuel, the prophet, the seer, has the ear of God. The problem is Samuel died. And Samuel was buried. Okay? Maybe Saul should have known our memory verse. Maybe Saul was looking for the wrong spirit. 2 Timothy 1.7 1 
For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7 Can you imagine if Saul had followed those wonderful words and asked God for that spirit of God? What a world of difference it would have made. All right, so Saul's scared. Ain't nothing happening. He doesn't know where to go. God's not answering him. All righty. So now we got Saul devises a plan, that tricky boy, all right? There's Saul, and there's a fortune teller. All right, in those days, well, God, God told us in the Levitical laws that we were not to seek out fortune tellers, that we were not to, to, to go to them. And Saul was pretty much kicking them out of the land and, and killing them, and, and so they were hiding and in fear, and, and they... They didn't, uh, you know, they didn't want to be known because they didn't want to get taken out. So Saul does a very wrong thing. Saul allows his fear to keep, take control. And instead of confessing his sin to God, he decides to go to a fortune teller to find out from Samuel, who's dead, what to do. Okay? God had told his people don't have anything to do with fortune tellers. Okay? So Saul looks for a fortune teller. His men says, well, we know of one. And he tricks a woman fortune teller into calling for Samuel. And then she realizes who this guy is because he was disguised. And she's scared to death because now all of a sudden there's King Saul confronting her. We read in 1 Samuel 28, 8 through 13. So Saul disguises himself and put on other garments so he didn't look like the king. And he went, he and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, divine for me, in other words, Check it out for me for a spirit and bring me up whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done, how he's cut off the mediums and the necrom ne necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But sw Saul swore to her by the Lord, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Well, first of all, Saul didn't have the right to swear for the Lord, but... Then the woman says, who shall I bring up for you? Saul says, bring up Samuel. Uh-oh. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a man coming out of the earth. Saul's so afraid he'll do anything. He knows he's not supposed to do this, but he doesn't care. And Samuel's spirit comes up, and Samuel you know, asks him, what are you doing? And Saul basically says, well, God won't answer me, so I'm coming to you. And Samuel called him foolish and told him that you know, see, God wasn't answering him because God had rejected him, and he had rejected God, and he had nothing to do with God for so long. But then he tells him something really bad. He tells them, Saul that he and his sons will die tomorrow on the battlefield. Oh, Saul is so afraid. He's so afraid that he collapses and almost, almost faints, okay? And they finally force some food into him to strengthen him up a little bit. So kids, who's, what spirit is in charge of Saul right now? What spirit has total control of his life? The spirit of fear. What spirit should have the control of his life? <clears throat> the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of God has control of our life, fear doesn't have a chance. Fear, there's no place for fear, okay? Fear has to stay away because the Holy Spirit fills up our mind, okay? So you guys remember our memory verse? Second Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 2, 7. All right. What spirit did God give us? The spirit of power and love and self-control. Fear has no place. Fear's got nowhere to stand. Laugh in the face of fear because your, your God has got your back. Okay? So, Saul confronts a medium and she says, Tomorrow you're, it's all over but the handshake, buddy. And uh, so he's scared death. But in the meantime, while all this is going on, David, in the land of the Philistines, finds out from Achish 
that he wants them to march with them. They're now going to go attack the Israelites. David's worst fear. I can't attack the people, my own people, but I can't say no because I'm here in the land of the Philistines. Now he's scared to death because he doesn't know what to do. His wrong choices are now coming back to bite him on the ankles, okay? Our wrong choices come back and bite us on the ankles, okay? So the Philistines, now they're marching towards the enemy, the Israeli army, and it takes two, three, four days. And, and as they get closer, David is getting more and more upset. But then God steps in, okay? But the Lord of the Philistine, the lords of the Philistine, the, the, the rulers, they were afraid of David because, I mean, David, remember what? David killed his ten thousands, Saul only his thousands. And so they didn't trust him, and they were afraid that in the heat of the battle, David would turn on the Philistines and help defeat them. <clears throat> so they order Achish to send him away. Achish is upset because he knows David is an awesome fighter, and he, they could use his 600 men, but they're in charge, and he's not. So he tells David that you're going to have to go. And David goes, well, why? What did we do wrong? And David's probably going, whoo, whoo. But, you know, he's, he's pretending, and, and Achish says, I know you're trustworthy, but they don't want you here, so you head on out, first light in the morning, you go back home. All right? Do you see the hand of God controlling this? Just a little while ago, you saw David scared because he didn't know how he was going to get out of this, because now he was going to go and have to attack his own people. God took care of it for him. Now, yes, he didn't trust God in certain things, but he trusted God in 99.9% .9 of everything. And so God took care of him, even though he does slip now and again, okay? So God took care of it for David to be sent away, him and his men. And so the Philistines thought that David was an honorable man, but they sent him away because they didn't trust him. So win-win situation, okay? Bet they all breathed a sigh of relief as they marched back, okay? God was so good to David, even though David had ignored God. So, first light, they all headed back to Ziklag. Remember, that was the city that Achish gave him. The trip took three days, roughly. <clears throat> the men were tired, and they were looking forward to being home with their families. And as they got closer, they got more and more excited. But as they got closer to Ziklag, they saw a horrible sight. They saw a bunch of smoke, and the city burned, and the people gone. And they were horrified because they had been raided by the Amalekites while they were gone to war, okay? Only smoke and rubble remained. The city was gone. Oh, my gosh, what to do? Ziklag is gone. The men are heartbroken. David is heartbroken. Their families are gone. Their wives and children, all their possessions, everything is gone. There's nothing left but a smoke and ruin. And what a, what a thing to come home to. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 and 2. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and come against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, all the children, all the livestock, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. Okay, now that's that's another hand of God thing. In most of the time, they, they'd kill anything and everything that, that they couldn't use, but they took everything, all the animals, all the women, all the children. The men had all gone to fight the battle, so there were no men there. <clears throat> David and his men are heartbroken, okay? The city's destroyed, their families are gone, they don't know what to do. To them, all hope is lost, all right? The men got so angry, they wanted to stone David. And what did David have to do with it? Well, you, David was in charge, so we're going to blame David. So, what did David do? David did what Saul should have done. 
David did what you and I should always do. David remembered to look to God for victory instead of looking to himself. <clears throat> because victory comes from God, not from us. <clears throat> victory comes from looking to God rather than looking at fear. When we look at fear, we've lost. We've lost the battle. We've lost the war. It's, it's over and done. We, we don't have a chance. David asked God what he should do, which is what we should do. We should ask God what to do. We read in 1 Samuel verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 6 to 8, But David strengthened himself in his God. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. It's the thing that they, the, the priest wears. So it's like a symbol of the priesthood. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? What do you want me to do, God, is what he's asking. And God answered him and says, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So God said, Man, I don't know. We'll see how it turns out. No, God says, Go. You will surely overtake them and you will surely rescue your families. So David was afraid, but he also remembered where to go when he was afraid, okay? There's nothing wrong with being afraid as long as you remember, as long as I remember where to turn. Okay, we turn to God because once we turn to God, the fear is driven away and we have his, him to guide us and direct us. Okay, so David asked God, what do we do? And God told him, go after him. You're going to get your stuff back. David knew that if God was for him, nobody could be against him. Okay. God told him to do something, and David knew that, that it was a done deal, that it would be accomplished, okay? All he had to do was step out in faith. God would make sure that his will was done. So who did David look to? He looked to the Spirit in our memory verse, 1 Timothy 2, 1, 7. 2, 7, I'm sorry. I wrote the wrong thing down. 2 Timothy it is one seven. For God gave us the spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. Second Timothy Timothy one seven. Okay, this is all the encouragement David needed. Okay, God says go. David says, I'm on my way. Or right, there was none of this. <laughs> I don't know what to do. He was out of there, him and his men, okay? Him and his men went after him the Amalekites, and they rushed in to attack him. They found them. Sprawled all over the land, partying and having a great old time because they had captured this town. They had all this loot and booty and, and slaves and critters, and, and they were just getting you know totally wasted. And David and his men rushed in to attack and pretty much destroyed them all, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 11 through 17 tells us a story. Kids, you can read it on your own because it's too much to read right now. But it'll give you the story of what happened, how they found him, what they did, how they chased him, how they got their families back. Okay? Oh, what do we see there? We see happy, happy, happy. Families are reunited. Isn't that awesome? All right. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 17 and 18 tells us, David had recovered all the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoils or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds and the people, drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So all the families were reunited. Nobody was lost. None of their stuff was lost. God had protected him and God had restored it. Why? Because David sought out God rather than on his own. We have no idea what the results would have been if David had, had struck out on his own. He may not have even ever found them. All right. 
God heard David and protected their families. Everything was recovered. Why? Because they looked to God for the victory. Okay, they didn't look to themselves. Who did Saul look to for his victory? The dead judge. Okay, he looked to himself. So David and his men returned to Ziklag and divided up the loot and the animals. Even those who had been too tired to pursue the Amalekites he gave portions to. David thought they're all part of it and they all get to share. Okay? David learned how important it was to look to God instead of trying to handle problems on himself. Had he looked to God, he would have never gone to the land of Philistines. Had he looked to God, he probably would have he had never gotten the city of Ziklag and had everybody captured. So kids, this is a story God wants us to learn. If you've asked Jesus to be your savior, do you look to Jesus to help you with your problems? When the problems come, tell God. Tell him all about your fears. He knows, but he wants to hear you. Thank him for his love. Ask him to help you to believe in him. Okay. Help him. Ask him to help you trust him for victory in whatever it is it's pursuing. Remember our memory verse, kids. 2 Timothy 1.7 But God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7 Kids, you can't have victory until you let Jesus into your life and let him start changing your sinful life. It's not going to happen. Trust me, you'd have changed by now if it could. Acts 16.31 tells us that if we believe in Jesus, we'll be saved. This means if we trust what Jesus did on the cross, we can be saved from our sins and what is waiting for the eternal souls of all those who don't ask him for forgiveness, which is eternal separation from God. Kids, you don't want that. All right? Make sure you're right with God. Make sure that you have asked him into your life. If you haven't and you want to, ask mom and dad, and they will help you with this. All right? So I got some questions for you, kids. Where did David and his men go because they were afraid of Saul? To the land of the Philistines. How did David try to prove to King Asius that he was loyally, loyal to him and would loyally serve him? He raided other enemies of Israel and said, look, we got this from the Israelites, and here's, here's the stuff. You know. So why was David upset when Achish told him that he'd go to the fight with the Philistines? He didn't want to fight his own people. He figured, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trapped. What am I going to do? If I say no, they'll kill me. If I say yes, I have to fight my own people. He didn't have a clue what to do. He was so upset and so scared. Okay? Why do fearful thoughts become sin? As When do fearful thoughts become sin? As God's child, and what should we do about it? It becomes sin when you let fear take control of your life, kids. And what do we do about it? We look to God for victory over our problems. Okay? Believing that he is who he said he is and believing that he can give us victory. We don't go to him and say, oh, Lord, I hope you can. We know he can. We just don't know if, if it's in his will to take it all away from us right now or let us muddle through it, you know. What sinful thing did Saul do when he was afraid, kids? He went to a fortune teller. To get advice from Samuel, who was dead. He didn't go to the one true living God and ask him what to do. All right. What terrible thing did Samuel tell Saul? He told him that Saul and his sons would die on the battlefield the next day. Oh, scary. How did God graciously free David from having to fight his own people? He caused the leaders of the Philistines to not trust him and to send him away. So he's going, woohoo, even though he's going, mm, you know, but he's probably very happy, okay? And it was a gracious God that allowed that, all right? 
So how did David get victory over the Amalekites? Remember the raiding party that took all his stuff? He looked to God. Looked to God for a victory. And then he followed his instructions. Because kids, that's kind of important that we follow God's instructions. What should we do as God's child when fearful thoughts come to mind? Tell God about your fears. Thank him that he loves you and ask him to help you trust him in victory. And remember our memory verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 1, 7. What spirit do you have, kids? Do you have the spirit of fear? If you do, you're asking the wrong spirit. All right. Do you have the spirit of power? Then you're asking the right spirit. Do you have the spirit of love? Then you're asking the right spirit. Self-control, the right spirit. So kids, what much must each of us do before we can have victory in life? We have to believe on the Lord Jesus as Savior from sin. Believing on doesn't mean we believe in Jesus, because even the demons believe in Jesus. Believing on Jesus means that we trust him for what he said he has done, and that he will do what he said he's going to do. Okay? So kids, what do you think? Do you want victory in life? You tired of being controlled by fear? Then turn to Jesus and ask him for, for victory. Jesus, help me. He's never going to say no. Kids, will you do it? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, oh Lord, what a wonderful story of David and his trust in you. Lord, thank you for showing us that when we don't trust you, things don't end well. But when we do trust you, we know that you're in charge, and we know that your will will be done, and we know that you will give us the victory that you've decided for us. So, Lord, we just thank you, and we ask you for your strength and your power to help us to, to remember these things and to help us to trust you and to help us to follow you. We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. All right, kids, what do you think? What spirit do you want? You want the spirit of God in you, or do you want the spirit of fear and of man in you? I don't think there's any choice, you know, any, any hard decision to make here, kids. So ask him. We'll see you later. God bless. Bye.